Complete Works of Charles Fort, F-O-R-T. Extraordinarily incredible book about all what he did, what Charles Fort did, is he researched all of the strangest, off-the-wall, strange things that have happened on the earth that there is no explanation for, period. No explanation. And he documents it, page after page, footnotes, everything, where the article appeared, who wrote it, what page it was on. That's the glory of his book, is that everything is documented. And the stuff he talks about in his book is just incredible to think that these things have actually happened on the earth. For instance, I'll give you a couple of examples of the kind of thing that's in his book that actually happened. And he gives you the footnotes of the newspaper it appeared in, and what day, and who wrote the article, what page. And uh, it happened in mid-California, in the middle of California. It's only happened, I think he said, twice. It's happened in the same city. <clears throat> and it's a little city in mid-California. And the first time it happened was back in the 1870s sometime. And the other was in the 19, early 1900s. In the same identical little town in California, on a crystal blue sky, no clouds in the sky, uh, completely clean, clear sky, huge two, three, four, five ton stones fell out of the sky onto the town. Some of them weighing five to six tons. and But they come falling out of the sky onto the town. But they don't fall at a normal rate. It takes all day for them to come down. They're coming down very, very slow takes all day for them to come down out of a crystal blue sky. So they're not falling at your typical speed no, of what, 9.8 feet per second squared? No, they're not falling at your normal It's no. just meters. It's some kind of a time-space... Yeah, Thank you. It's some kind of a time-space continuum crossover where... Now, this was witnessed where people saw this and... Yeah, it's in the newspapers. People, uh, people were out there watching it. They took pictures of it. It was in the newspaper with these big stones, you know, some of them, like I said, four and five tons apiece falling out of a crystal blue sky on this little town. And what was interesting is they went on to say that when the, when the stones were finally, after all day coming down, it takes all day to get here, when it finally hit, it would bury itself into the ground, the sand would blow up as it normally would, in slow motion. Everything was in slow motion. When it buries itself, it would bury itself exactly how deep it normally would bury itself. But it wouldn't happen quickly if no. it happened. No, take it all day well, that's long. That's almost like a different, if you read, as we discussed in one of the earlier shows, is a different uh, it was a time, know, frequency a, a or a time. Different time, what do you call it, time-space continuum or something. Uh, and there was, a, there was an older man, he passed away, a dear friend. I, I, I've known him for many years. He was 90-something years old. I used to go visit him because he had a wonderful mind, fascinating man, knew a lot about law and all kinds of strange things. He had been in the service for many years in the Navy and retired. And I went to visit him many, many times and sit and chat with him and listen to all the old stories of the old days in the military and all that kind of thing. And uh, but he was telling me, um, and that that reminds me. I want to tell you something else. I'm going to write her name down. But anyway, he was telling me that when he was flying, he was a I guess a squadron commander or something like that in the navy. And uh, this was back in the 40s, uh, late 40s, early 50s. And he said, as I was I was in the lead plane, and I was the captain of the lead plane. I had a bunch of them following me. And we were out over the Bermuda Triangle. And he says, I told my co-pilot to take over because he was going to the boys' room. He was going to the bathroom. So he said, I went, in the, I went in the bathroom and I came out. But when I came out, I was in a different plane. Uh, I was in a totally different plane. And he said, everybody looked at me like I was crazy. And I'm wondering, what the hell, are, where the hell am I? In a totally different plane. And now, and the guys in the plane they're looking at me, and he says, and they were in uniforms that was uh, older uniforms, like from the very early Air Force days. And he said, I could tell the uniforms were not the modern ones I was wearing. And he says, and they looked at me, I looked at them, and he said, and I walked past them, and nobody said anything because it was so startled to see me. And I'm startled. He said, I'm walking up to see who's flying this plane. 
and there's a captain sitting there, and he said, and I talked to the captain. I asked him, what are you doing? Where am, what are you doing in this plane, and where am I? And the captain said, you know, who the hell is this guy? He says to his pilot, co-pilot, who is this guy? Did, did he store away on this ship? And, uh, and the captain says, you know, uh, uh, you know I'm going to put him under arrest, and we're going to when we turn, when we return, we got to find out who this guy is. He you know, stowed away on the ship, and he said, "I didn't stow away on any ship. I'm a captain. See my see the credentials here. I'm a captain of in, in, the, in the navy." And and the, and he said, and "The other captain said, well, you may be a captain in the navy, but on this ship, I'm the captain, not you. And so I run this ship." <laughs> And so he says, so we stood there arguing with each other. And he says, so I, I looked at the controls, and I couldn't fly this plane anyway. I'm not familiar with this kind of a plane. I don't know. So he said, I just, and he said, go back and sit down, and we'll talk to you when we land. So he said, I went back, and I thought to myself, to hell with it. I'm going to go back into the boys' room. And he said, I went back in, and I, then I turn around and come back out, and I'm in my own plane. And he says, so, and he's like 90 some odd years old telling me this in private. And he says, so all I'm telling you is I was there and I was in a different plane and I went back in time to see that I was in a plane that was many years earlier because the guys were wearing different uniforms that wasn't in the, 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 the plane we were in. Parallel universes. So parallel universe. Or something. Something like mm -hmm. that. And he said, so I, how do you explain it? He said, I can't. I'm just telling you what happened. I'm telling you those things happened in the Bermuda Triangle. Yeah, I've had experiences uh, in Eleuthera. I had a driving a car one time, and a thunderstorm came up, as they do sometimes in the summertime. And, uh, you know, all the gauges on the car at the time just went dead. You know, there was just, you know, the car completely died. Where did you say you were? In Eleuthera in the Bahamas. Okay. It's one of the Bahamian islands. And, uh this electrical storm came in, and I'm driving along, you know, heading back to the hotel, and, you know, this storm kind of came off the ocean and, you know, lightning, whatnot, and every gauge on the vehicle just stopped. Wouldn't work anymore. Yeah. Well, that's you know. what pilots say. When you fly over the Bermuda Triangle, all of your gauges and everything goes haywire. Everything. Yeah, all there's all flips there's out. There's a lot the of that there. Well, that goes <clears> into, you know, as we've talked about in the past, and if you get into the different vortexes and the different... Uh, what the longitude and latitude lines, even where you'll find, uh, you know, certain churches. And what's that island off of on the southern coast of England that has a lot of that as well? It's Isle of Wight. Yep, Isle of Wight. Isle of Wight is where a lot of the uh, longitude and latitude, and you'll get a lot of the... Those ley lines. Ley yeah, lines. Those, yeah. those. Yeah. And a lot of the big churches around the world are, yep, are on the, set on, on the ley rose, lines. rose median and ley yeah. lines. Yeah, yeah. Now, you know, here's what I was going to tell you about this, this, uh, this lady. Her name is Gracie. When I came to California in 1959, uh, one of the first places I found, it was a big house in North Hollywood, and out in the backyard, the people uh, had a big piece of property, and out in the backyard, the owners had built about five or six little cottages, little small cottages to rent. So I, I got one, I moved in, and it was just like a one room, uh, like a little bachelor kind of thing. But uh, when I moved in, there was a lady that only had one one bedroom. All the rest of them were little bachelors, but there was a one bedroom in the middle. And in that one bedroom was a was a very old lady named Gracie. Gracie. And uh, she was an incredible lady. And I loved Gracie. She was very, very kind, very sweet. Um and so I used to run errands for her. I was 19 years old, and she's about 90. So I'd run errands for her, and and she had a she had a little dog that must have been 100 years old too. And she would take push the dog out in a baby carriage <laughs> and walk around the, the neighborhood. And everybody knew Gracie. Gracie's got the dog, and she's walking around with the dog in her and the carriage. I would go and um, you know for errands for her. So one night she calls me and she said, "Why don't you?" come over for dinner tonight. I said, I'd love to. I'd never been in her house before, her one-bedroom apartment. When I walked in, in her front room, I was shocked. She had all of these pictures all over the wall. It must have been 30 or 40 of them. Beautiful pictures all over the walls of all the top gangsters in the world. Al Capone, Legs Diamond, Meyer Lansky, Lucky Luciano, Bugsy Siegel, 
all the big shots, all the na all these pictures, and she was a beautiful dance hall girl in Chicago, beautiful girl. But she was in with all the top guys, period, all the mafiosis and gangsters. She said, I know them all. They're all my friends. And so I said, Gracie, I said, this is incredible. You knew all these people? And she said, I knew them all. I said, tell me about these people. And she sat there for the rest of the evening and gave me all kinds of background on all the different mafiosi gangsters and who they were, what they were doing, who was working with who. Al Capone, she was, and, you know. And she knew all these guys from back in her dance hall days yeah, in well, Chicago. She a, or yeah, she was a, a beautiful girl, and uh, and all the guys, uh, and she said they all um, <clears throat> were very generous to her, always throwing money at her. And she said so, and so she had a couple of pictures where she was actually sitting on Al Capone's lap hmm. with a bunch of other guys all around. And Capone's obviously having a ball. He's laughing with her. So I said, tell me about Capone. And she said, I asked Al that night, that very night, I asked him in front of everybody, how is it that you are able to do what you do? And everybody in the world knows who you are. They know your, they know your face. They know what you're doing. Everybody in town knows who you are. The government knows who you are. I mean, nobody ever bothers you. You just go. You, know, you just do what you do and get get away with it. How do you do that? How do you get away with something that everybody in in Washington D.C. knows who you are, and what you're doing? Everybody in in Chicago knows who you are, but nobody bothers you. And he said, "That's oh, Gracie." He said, and this is what she told me. She said, "Al Capone said to me, Gracie, I am merely a small cog in a big operation. I have masters above me. I answer to." It goes all the way up to Washington, D.C. I'm their boy. I take care of business for the guys in Washington, D.C., in Philadelphia, for the big shots that run this country. I, t I take care of business for them that they don't want to do. And for that, they let me play my games and do my thing. That's it. We got, a, we got an understanding. That's why I love those movies, The Godfather 1, 2, and 3. Godfather 3 was actually based on, a, well, all three of them were, but especially Godfather 3 was actually based on a real-life story about uh, propaganda due. It was called P2. Go back and do some research. Well, the Pope, on, well that Pope lasted for 33 days, per, per 32, John Paul. Yeah, 32 days. Was he it 30, died on the 33rd. It was 33. He died on the 33rd day. Mm -hmm. And that's the significance, but uh, well, you know, <laughs> right. we don't have to talk about that. Yeah. Even in the movie, what's the Cuban boy that, that became the mafia? Garcia, became, Andy Garcia. Yeah, Andy Garcia. Twice Andy Garcia says in, that, in The Godfather 3, twice he mentions it was P2. He says to uh, to Al Pacino, uh, so and so uh, was there, and it was P two did this, and P two did that. That's propaganda due. P two Lodge, uh, operating within the the Vatican. So it was a profoundly evil uh, occult order, uh, assassinations, killings, child abuse, all kinds of stuff going on with this a group called P two. Look it up. Go out and uh, look it up on the web and go well, to the, the library. Well, the interesting thing is who's actually giving them the orders, and that's the question you ask. Yeah, yeah. The question is, was P2 running the Pope or was the Pope running P2? Well, the new Pope, that Pope that was coming in, had told the, the, the cardinals, do not make me— that was in the book. There were many books written about P2, and they said— some of the investigators were talking about uh, one of them was called God's Banker. Uh, and he the was book found called hanging God's from Banker. a bridge. Right, exactly. He was found hanging in London, on the London Bridge. One of the main bankers for the Vatican was found hanging from his neck, <laughs> hanging by his neck on the Blackfriars Bridge in England. Why? Because he screwed up some kind of a financial deal that cost the, the Vatican billions of dollars. And if you cost the Vatican billions of dollars, you're going to know they're going to kill you. You're not going to you're not going to screw up some kind of a big business deal or dope deal or drug deal or something. Whatever it was that that uh, Lucio 
Jelly and Roberto Calvi. The Calvi was the one that was actually found in the hanging. He was the one hung. He, he was, was the, the one that was hung. For the right. His name was Roberto Calvi. And the bank that he was the president of, which was handling the Vatican money, was Banco Ambrosiano. And Banco Ambrosiano was handling money for the Vatican. Well, in the movie Godfather Three, uh, it shows the mafia right there in the Vatican. Remember? Uh, uh, Michael Carleone and his attorney. Who was the guy with the attorney we were talking about before at lunch? What is his name? Very, very good actor, but he played the attorney for Michael Carleone. Oh, um, George, George Hamilton. George Hamilton. Hamilton. Yep, that's right. George Hamilton. Yeah. yeah. He played the, the, the attorney for that's Michael right. Carleone. Okay. Remember George Hamilton? Well, George Hamilton and Michael Carleone are sitting right there in the Vatican. Mm -hmm. And then... If you remember in Godfather 3, on the very beginning of the movie, uh, Al Pacino, the, uh, the Godfather, uh, is being knighted in New York City and in the church in New York. And the cardinal is knighting him. Incidentally, when you are knighted with a sword, when the king or queen knights you, and they put the sword on one shoulder and the sword on the other. Do you know what that symbol means? It means that you are being commissioned to do something at the point of death. The sword is on you. You are not being asked to do it. You are being appointed, appointed to, do it. to do it. And if you don't do it, I have the I have the ability to take this sword from this shoulder and put it over here on this shoulder through your neck. So that's what the symbol of the sword knighthood. on your shoulder is. I'm going to go over your head this time. I'm going over your head. But the next time. But the next time, I'm going to go through the head. I'm going well, to go. What is the, isn't there a law, too, for a U.S. citizen to be knighted? Or uh... Yeah, the, that's the 13th Amendment. says that no American can be knighted. Nobody, Nobody uh, reads uh, the America's law America's the most lawless country in the world, so we do anything we want. It doesn't matter what the Constitution says. It doesn't matter what the law says. It doesn't matter about nothing. Whatever the guys in, in power want to do, they do it. What are you going to do about it? So their feeling is, what are you going to do about it? So if it's unconstitutional, it's a felony, and it's against the law, so what are you going to do? We run your country. We own it. We own you. So what are you going to do about it? And American people, they don't know. They never read. Nobody knows no, anything about clueless. the 13th Amendment. They didn't even know there was 12 before it. You know? <laughs> so, but uh, anyway, but in that movie, uh, Godfather 3, twice um, they talk about P2. P2 was called, look it up, anyone listening to this program, look up some information on the just the letter P. P2. It's called Propaganda Dewey or P2 Lodge. There's a lot of information out there. Many books have been written by investigators in Italy on the P2 Lodge. And what P2 Lodge basically is, it's a secret society operating in the Vatican, inside the Vatican, that is actually under the auspices of a higher order. It's a Masonic oh. thing, isn't it? Well, it was, uh, it's a quasi, quasi yeah, it's Masonic. Almost a, it was a sect that went off it on their own. It was a sect, yeah. It went they off were, on their they own. Were, they supposedly had the sentence from Masonic, but they're really a, their Bank, own. It was Banco Ambrosiano and. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, but I mean, there's a, a, there's a, a there's a great wiki on it that I've read. Yeah, that's, that's right. Uh, there's a lot of information. A lot of information. Pretty incredible. I mean, they were even tied up in the Falklands War Precisely. and uh, selling Exocet missiles to uh, that's uh, right. Peru to sell, and Peru sold them back uh, to back to Argentina or off to Argentina, and this was all paid for on a uh, Banco Ambrosiano credit card. Mm -hmm. Yep, right. <laughs> two hundred million dollar credit card bill. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, <laughs> so P two is under the auspices of another more dangerous and very, very scary operation inside the Vatican called Opus Dei. Or yep, Opus, Opus Dei. Dei. Opus Dei, Opus Dei. Um, that is a very, very right-wing, fascist, totalitarian, fascist, right-wing Well, uh, Da Vinci Nazi. Code tapped into it a little yeah, bit. Yeah, Da Vinci Code touched on a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. Incidentally, they... Uh, the, the I'm not going to name the company, but there was a company called me and asked me if I would be um, um, interested in being a consultant to the motion picture. Mm -hmm. um, well, you get those approaches all the time, all the time. from Hollywood. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, you were telling you know I think at lunch today you were talking about how you were 
privilege to go through, uh, you know, that very well-known filmmaker's library. And, oh uh, yeah, yeah. I went know. to Steven Spielberg. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I was, I was in, I went there and met the lady who was in charge of. This lady is from England. Her husband had just passed away. And I don't know if she's still there. This was quite a few years ago, but it was when Steven Spielberg first opened up his um, SKG studios. Yeah, Spilt, uh, DreamWorks right with here. DreamWorks, yeah. SKG uh, DreamWorks over in Glendale. And I had an opportunity to go there and to meet this lady who was the head of his research department. And uh, and so I, I talked with her, and then I was invited to come over and talk with her, which I did. And uh, she was telling me, she said, uh, Stephen is a stickler for making sure things are done right on a movie. So any clothes, any terms, words, symbols, whatever would have been there, that's what he wants. He wants everything to be exactly the way it would have been. The clothes have to be exactly correct. Well, I think he and Mr. Lucas are phenomenal at research. and uh, Oh, incredible. And, uh, and the actual... Uh, you know the detail. I mean, if you I'm look at both of their films, with, with, with what's going on. Oh yeah, well, Lucas. I mean, he's. Uh, well, know, I, I'm going to tell you something that's out of school, but but the one thing I will say, I had lunch with Michael Eisner and George Lucas, and uh, a bunch of other guys like that out at Disney. There was a private party, and I was invited to, and I got pictures of, of some of them on yeah. my website of me with having lunch with Eisner and, and Lucas. Uh, George Lucas said to me when I first met him. Uh, he said to me, well, he didn't know me, uh, and so uh, I went and sat down because the way it, the way it worked is that uh, they have food everywhere out there on uh, all the best cooks and all the best food you can imagine and different areas, all, all kinds of national f foods, mm -hmm. and any, you can pick whatever you want. And then they had all these tables and, and long chairs, I mean long tables and chairs. So you just pick up, get whatever you want to eat and just sit down somewhere. And so I got what I wanted, and I sat down uh, where I didn't realize where I sat down. I'm sitting right next to Michael Eisner, and across <laughs> from him is George Lucas and, and Danny DeVito and a couple of other people. I don't know. I just sat down, and here I am right in the middle of them. And so I just uh, George Lucas introduced himself, and, and, I, and I shook hands with him, and he said, your name? And I said, Jordan Maxwell. And he said to me, he said, oh, you did a book with Steve Allen, didn't you? It was a red-color book. And it was called something about the book your church doesn't want you to read. Mm -hmm. And I said, yes, I did. And I said, I'm, I'm amazed you know about that. And he said, well, the only reason I know is because I don't read books. I don't have time to sit and read books. But I pay uh, a lot of people to read books for me. Mm -hmm. And he said, but this one particular book, my wife liked. And she was very interested in this whole subject of religion and occult theocracy and all that. And so she particularly liked your part in the book, what you were writing about astral theology. And so she made me sit down and read your part. So that's why I remember your name in the book. Because yeah, and I admire both of those filmmakers, uh, you know, Spielberg and uh, Lucas. I mean, they've touched on a lot of different subjects. Oh, that, have they ever? You know, over the years that are were almost documentaries to a degree. You know, yeah, to look I mean, at the I, Indiana I, Jones and oh, yeah. even what's going on, uh, you know, with the Star Wars. And, and what about this last one, uh, Indiana Jones and the Crystal Skull? Well, oh, the Crystal Skulls, you've had a chance to actually oh, hold I one was, of them. Absolutely. I mean, this yeah. was back in 1980s. What was I, her name that she found one in one of the Mayan tombs? Yeah, that was Canadian. Annie, Annie Mitchell Hedges. Yep, the Annie Hedges. Mitchell Hedges. Yep. But, but Nick, the guy's name is Nick Nosorino. He passed away. And what an incredibly dear, fascinating, interesting, and wonderful man that was. Nick Nosorino. No Sorino. And it's good that you should know that name and look him up. You will not find a more fascinating man than that. Well, he researched the, the all the stuff on the crystal well, skulls. I, I think I was it. I, no, it wasn't IBM. It was. Uh, it was IBM I, and uh, well, and three M company. Yeah, three M tried to find out, and it was crystal of not oh, this earth. That's right. Not and, of this. And world. I've talked to actually. I've had experience with people that have actually held the the, the Mitchell Hedges the Mitchell Hedges skull. Yeah. And uh, you know they were able to look into the future, look into the past. Do you know what some of that stuff he was telling? He was uh, he was he was telling us. That uh, that the actual crystal skulls, there's nine of them, 
that we that they have yep. today. There's there's hundreds of crystal skulls in South America, but there were nine Original really life size real crystal skulls. The rest of them are, are little replicas for sale, but um, there were nine crystal skulls found. And this and the best one, uh, the the Vatican has one of the crystal skulls, one of them, one of the nine, and the British Museum has one, the the Louvre Museum has one, and Annie Mitchell Hedges, who was mentioned, Mitchell Hedges was yeah. mentioned in the movie uh, Indiana Jones and Crystal Skull, and his name was mentioned two or three times, Mitchell Hedges. Well, she f- didn't. She f- she was on a. She found it. She actually put her hand in and, and grabbed it. She yeah. was a little young child at the time. Right. She was a I little understand. girl. And she was in South America, and and she w- and the father was an uh, was an archaeologist, a paleontologist, and he was m- m- uh, mulling around in the ruins, and she was too as a kid. And so she she said she went over and she saw this little crystal. Uh, showing from the dirt, yeah, and she the, moved the light it. hit it, and yeah. she grabbed it, and and well, she said she cleaned off the dirt and actually saw it was a crystal skull, and she said so she pulled that out and shows her dad she found the skull, saw that crystal, but it had moving, it had a, a skull, it had crystal jaws. Well, this colleague of mine who actually held it, he said, you know, he said when he held it, his whole body like tingled, and he looked into this thing, and he said he was able to see parts of his past. That's right. And he said it looked like part of his future. That's he right. He said it was a very, uh, it was an experience that he he will never forget. Absolutely incredible. Yeah. I mean, I, before I get off, my God, once we get on these subjects, I got so many of them. <laughs> Dr. Roger Lear, Dr. Mm-hmm. Roger Lear, spell L-E-I-R. Roger Lear is an extraordinarily interesting man. Uh, he's the, right in here, right here in the, in the outskirts of L.A. Yeah, we've talked to him, I yeah. think, at the last— uh, Dear friend yeah. of mine, but Dr. Roger Lear, he is the, he's the famous uh, doctor who uh, takes the uh, alien extraterrestrial and alien implants out of humans because uh, many people who have been given implants, metal implants in their body by the aliens. Well, there's a gal in the Pacific Palisades here who— uh, I guess has been abducted, and she, she, you know, you'll see her. She's on Discovery oh, yeah, Channel. I, I, and I, I, I know you. But mean, she gives yeah. these, uh, I think, these weekly little seminars at her house and discusses it. Yeah, well, Doctor Lear uh, has he's actually operated on nine or ten people where they actually go in. Somebody will, um, well, don't let me forget. I don't want to forget this about uh, the cigar boxes. Remind me of the cigar boxes. Okay. okay. So Dr. Lear said that somebody will go into uh, a doctor to to have their arm or their wrist or their leg uh, 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 x-rayed, and they will find in the x-ray a piece of metal inside the leg or inside the arm or the toe or whatever. And it's a piece of metal. Well, it's an alloy that's, from what I've you know heard about this, it's an alloy that's Almost like a magnesium that's been so refined and uh, yeah, smelted that it's but, that's, but it's some kind of a metal. The doctor will tell the person, "Well, I don't know if you know this or not, but you got a piece of metal inside your leg." And what's interesting is that the body does not react to it. The body doesn't know it's there. And so, if, if you hadn't have gone in for an X-ray for something else, you would have never known it was there. But now that you saw it, now you know there's a piece of metal inside your leg. And the obvious question is, first of all, how does a piece of metal get inside your leg or inside your arm or inside your foot? How does it get there? And second of all, there's no, there's no wounds, and the, and the body doesn't react to it, so the body didn't even know it was there. So how is that possible? Well, they go in and they operate. They cut and they go in and pull this thing out and cut it off. And he says, and when they pull it out, he's shown them to me. They're little tiny uh, diodes, little tiny things, and they're, they're beeping a signal. You can't hear it, but it's beeping a signal. And he says, so we took it to uh, some military uh, laboratory, and they turn on these machines to pick up electrical frequencies, and they said, this thing is beeping a signal. Look at it. It's beeping mm. a signal. So, uh, in other words, people were walking around with some little diode of some kind, a little... A little microchip. A little, a little microchip or something. Yeah. Yep. Inside their their body or their foot, their chest or whatever, their arm, and it's beeping a signal. And he said, and the signal is a, uh, is the exact frequency. All of these little things had the same identical frequency. 
And he said the frequency is the exact frequency that the astronauts use to communicate with the Earth, that there's a secret frequency that only NASA knows, that only NASA uses, and only astronauts are allowed to use that one frequency. Only the astronauts can use So when can you're in the it. space station, you're communicating back to NASA or JPL. Right. Then That's you can use that special frequency where nobody can can pick it up. Nobody knows about it. China doesn't can't read it. Nobody else can. It's a special frequency that NASA has developed for the space and for the astronauts. And he said that's the exact frequency this little thing is beeping at. So whoever it put this inside of you, whoever put this little thing inside of you, he said it wrap the 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 thing is wrapped with some kind of a celluloid or plastic wrapping that you cannot take a, a surgical knife and cut. You can't cut it. It won't cut. And you, they've tried to cut into it. It can't, won't, won't do it. It's it a, won't it's do a it. material that it will. Yeah. Uh, it will, cannot be cut. And yet that 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 cover around this little thing uh, is made of your your DNA. Is uh, it's, it has your DNA in that plastic film that's wrapped around that little beeping device. So somehow or another, they took your, they take a scoop mark out of your skin. They take a scoop out, and, and people figure find out your DNA. Mark. And they they analyze your DNA. Then they put that DNA into this plastic, and therefore, when they put it into your body, your body does not see uh, this thing. It does not doesn't register it. So therefore, you will never see it. You'll never know it's there unless you accidentally happen to uh, go to a doctor and need an x-ray and then they find it but now i got i got a story for you Uh oh dr lee has told me we've sat for hours talking about interesting stuff and i've got some stories i mean paul tice i gotta tell you some of paul tice's stories too he'll blow your mind but dr roger lear was telling me he said that he went to uh, uh ecuador and when he was in Ecuador, he went down there to speak at a conference, a medical conference. He was in Ecuador. Uh, but he said, I went by to see a doctor friend of mine that I had known for many years, a good friend of mine who has a clinic down there in Ecuador. And so he said, so I went to see him. Well, this doctor has a little uh, museum that he built down there and all kinds of strange little artifacts that have been found in Ecuadorian jungle and the temples in Ecuador have been collected, and he's just a collector, and he's been collecting these strange little creatures and little, you know, little spacemen and little rockets and all kinds of interesting stuff <laughs> in this museum. So Dr. Lear, so, so I was roaming around the museum with him, and he was showing me all these fascinating little things that have been found in temples, etc. And he said, then the doctor said to him, he said, now i got to show you something really interesting. He said, come to my office. So he's, Lear says, so they go back into the doctor's office, and he goes over to the wall. He's got a wall safe, and he opens the wall safe, and there's a cigar box in the safe. And he said he pulls out the cigar box, and Dr. Lear said, I was sitting down at his desk, and this guy, this doctor, pulls out this uh, cigar box, and he opens the cigar box, and in there are two um, crabs, two dead crabs. And he said he, he picked the two crabs up out of the box and put them in front of Dr. Lear on, on the desk and told Lear, he said, look at this and you explain it to me. What are you looking at? And explain it to me. And Lear said, I took on my glasses and looked at it, and he says, I could not believe what I was actually, in fact, seeing. He said, these two crabs, where the eyes and the mouth would be on the crab, was a human skull, uh, absolute to, 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 to size, little tiny human skull, but perfectly in, uh, in proportioned, perfectly proportioned human skull that had... Uh, uh, a, a, a bone in the back of the skull holding it, and it was connected directly into the shell of the crab so that the skull was a part of the crab's shell, but it was separate, but it was connected by some kind of a, of a bone. And he said, two human skulls, little human skulls looking at me, um, 
on a crab, on the on the two crabs. And he says, I have no idea how to explain this. And he said, I just kept looking at it. I'm thinking, what in the hell am I seeing? And he said, that's right. I don't know either. But it looks like somebody was able to uh, manipulate um, DNA and, and were playing around with, with life and crossbreeding animals with animals and crossbreeding animals with humans, taking DNA and putting it into well, an animal, into a fish. Isn't some of that like Plum Island, what they're doing? Exactly. Right off of the tip of Montauk. That's exactly right. And, uh, and also the movie back in 1938, Island of Lost Souls with uh, Charles Lawton. Charles Lawton, back in 1938, made a movie called Island of Lost Souls. In 1965, Burt Lancaster reprised uh, uh, the movie and did it again called The Island of Dr. Moreau. And then just before Marlon Brando died, he did his last movie, The Island of Dr. Moreau. And then, well, this goes all the way back to 1938. Why? In 38, it's because that's what the Nazis were doing. Nazis were also were oh, crossbreeding animals with humans. That's all, and it's been going on even in America, even on the, in the island of Grenada, down in the in the Caribbean, in the island of Grenada. That was the medical school where Reagan medical. sent in the troops to exactly. Yeah, and a lot of that's been going. If you go back into Greek history, where they were doing it, that's right. They were talking cross about the crossbreeding animals the, with humans, the man and the ball, and that's right. And so he says, so somebody had the technology and how, knew how to crossbreed humans with, uh, with fish, crossbreed humans with animals. And I asked him, I said, look at all my life I have been told that, that you can't crossbreed. You know, uh, he said, no, that's not correct at all. We now know that DNA and the, uh, the you know, our knowledge now, we now know you can cross life forms. You can cross and he was talking about how the, that um, this government, U.S. government, along with England, Austria, and Germany, uh, have, got, have been working on together uh, cross-breeding animals with humans. I mean, I'm, and, and I've been the hearing— cloning, I've, the I've cloning heard, that's taking place right now with the technology. It's yeah. Not, you know. well, and the, well, look at Hollywood, like, like my dear friend Dick Gregory always says. Dick says Hollywood does three things. They tell you what your masters who own this earth, what they've done in the past, what they're doing now, and what they're getting ready to do. That's what Hollywood does. They're telling you something in the movies. 